Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about Laplace's equation in cylindrical coordinates. For this particular problem, we're given that we have this metal cylinder of radius a and height h. It's being held at a constant v equals zero, as presumably it's connected to the ground, and the top end cap is being held at a constant v equals negative v1. What sorts of things could we start to try to ponder about this? situation. Well, first of all, what is the potential and electric field inside of this cylinder? I'm not going to worry about what they are outside of the cylinder for day, just inside of the cylinder. We could also start to ponder what kinds of bound charges are there on the surface of and inside of the water itself. Now, we can note that the water is conductive. I mean, it's not noted that it's di water, so we're just going to assume it has some ions floating around in it, and those are giving it some conductivity, which means that if the edges are being held at v equals zero, then the water itself must also be held at v equals zero, especially on the surface. Now, because of this, we can set our basis where z equals zero at the surface, z equals h over two, because the whole cylinder is h long, and z equals negative h over two at the bottom. Now, how are we going to go about solving this problem? We're going to be using Laplace's equation, where the Laplacian of v is equal to zero. The Laplacian cylindrical coordinates is given by this equation, where normally you'll see an S instead of an R. We'll be using R for this video just because a capital R is a little bit more distinct from a lowercase r. To solve this partial differential equation, we're going to be splitting up into a series of ordinary differential equations with one variable each. To do this, we'll be using the ansatz that z, sorry, that v of r theta, or sorry, phi and z is equal to some function r of r times some function capital phi of phi times some function z of z. Next, we'll be plugging in v into our del squared equation to give us del squared v is equal to 1 over r d dr of r times dv dr, which is r times. Now let's note ddr operating on this whole equation here, this does not depend on r and this does not depend on r. So we're just going to get r prime times those two. So it's going to be r prime times phi times z. Then likewise for the next part, we're going to get plus one over r squared times d2 d phi squared operating on this whole thing. Again, phi is the only thing that depends on phi. So we're, this is going to give us r phi double prime times z. And lastly, we have just a lone d2 dz squared, which gives us r phi z double prime. Simplifying this equation down further, we're going to get the following, well, after some derivatives and algebra, we get this equation right here. Now, on its own, it doesn't look like this helps very much, but if you look a little closer, we can notice that each of these terms are still grouped into these terms z, phi, r, 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 z, phi, etc. Now what all this means is that for any given equation here, we can factor everything in terms of z, and then factor everything in terms of phi, and then factor everything in terms of r. And then what we're going to get is three different equations where it'll be z times some stuff plus z double prime times some stuff. And all that stuff, sure, it's going to be in terms of r and phi, but it's not going to be in terms of z, which means that we can treat it for z as a constant. Likewise, for phi, we can group it in terms of phi and for r. Now, to see what I mean, let's just give an example. Here, I've grouped everything in terms of z. So we have some stuff times z plus some stuff times z double prime. Dividing both sides by this constant here, because again, none of this depends on z, so it's effectively a constant here. This yields the following ordinary differential equation. z double prime plus a constant times z is equal to zero. We've seen this before if you've taken an ordinary differential equations class. This means that it's either an exponential, that is an e to the something times z, or it's a sine disoidal function that's oscillating, which again can be related to an exponential via Euler's identity. So here we can start with the onsets that z, the function, is equal to some constant times e to the kz. And that will yield us that z double prime is equal to k squared z. Let's hold on to that for right now. 
for the future, but let's also use it real quick. K z double prime, plugging this in here, gives us k squared plus a times z equals zero, which means that a is equal to negative k squared. Now here we have to pause. Is z sinusoidal or exponential? Let's look again at our graph or our visualization here. We have the potential is zero at z equals zero, and it is decreasing to some v equals negative v1 up here, which in my mind makes me immediately think exponential. And while it could still be sinusoidal, let's say just for argument that it's exponential. And we'll see later on that this works out and gives us a correct solution. So you can go on your own and try to try it for sinusoidal, but let's just continue with this. Now, since z is an exponential function, we can say that k is an element of the real numbers. If it was complex, then we would get an oscillating sinusoidal function. But here we have that z is equal to c1 times e to the kz minus c2 e to the minus kz. Now, we also know that the potential is 0 at z equals 0. So we can use that boundary condition to say, hey, 0 is equal to c1 times this whole term at z equals 0 is 1 because it's e to the 0. And then that's plus, sorry, plus c2. What we can then notice is that c1 equals negative c2, and we'll just rewrite this. We'll get rid of the subscripts up here, and we'll replace this with a minus. Now, looking at this, this looks a lot like sine h. And since c is just some arbitrary, con arbitrary constant, we can just say that z is equal to negative a sine h. I'm using a negative here at the front to indicate the fact that it's decreasing again, because we have this, at, it's at zero at the potential zero at z equals zero, and that decreases to negative v1 up here. So we should have this negative sine out front, and then a is going to be a positive constant. So this is our equation for z, and then we also have that z double prime is equal to, let's look up here, z double prime is k squared z. So we'll write that right here, k squared z. And now we solve the z component of this. Again, regrouping Laplace's equation up here, in terms of phi, we get that it's something times phi double prime plus something plus phi is equal to zero. Now we can, we've seen this just before with z, we can say that phi double prime plus m squared plus times phi is equal to zero. We know, however, that this is, it's a loop. Phi is operating on the, the, the loop part of the cylinder, which means that at the same point, after going all the way around here, it has to come back to where it is. So it has to be oscillating as m increases. So we have that phi, let's start off with non so we get to the point that phi is equal to some constant am times cosine plus a constant bm times sine, all of this of m phi. Now, you might be noticing v should be symmetric across phi, like phi of phi should be one. V should be changing as you go around the, the cylinder, it's symmetric, so we have that m has to be zero. If m is anything other than zero, then this thing's oscillating and this thing's oscillating. So m has to be zero, in which case this is just one, and this is all zero, which gives us that m equals zero, and a sub zero is equal to one. In other words, we'll just rewrite it, phi equals one. Now we just did a bunch of math to find these equations right here on the left. So let's look at this equation up here again. This time we're gonna be looking for r. Now this is the most difficult part. Z and phi, they just had, it was a simple second ordinary differential equation. It was linear too. Here we have all these phi's and z double primes, but we know that z phi is constant with respect to r. So we can divide it out and the right hand side zero, so it's not gonna change. So we have z phi times this stuff plus z phi double prime. Well, phi double prime, this whole thing is just, again, let's look over here. Phi double prime is negative m squared phi. Now you might be thinking, well, phi double prime should be zero because phi is one, but let's just ignore that for now and let's continue as if we don't know that yet. z times phi double prime is equal to negative m squared z phi, right? And then here we have phi times z double prime. Well, this is just, Again, let's look over at our cheat sheet. Z double prime is k squared times z. So we're gonna say it's k squared phi z. Oh, sorry, that's the function. Now we can divide everything out and we just get that r double prime plus one over r r prime plus negative m squared over r squared times r plus k squared phi times z is it sorry nope that phi times z is 
cancel that, plus k squared r equals zero. Now it's important to note that I didn't know how to solve this equation here off the top of my head, so I consulted the Handbook of Mathematical Functions by these two names, which I'm not going to say because I'm afraid to butcher them. I'll be citing them in the description, but they give us a different function of a different form. And to make it map a little bit better, let's multiply everything. We have these r's in the denominator. Let's get rid of that. Let's multiply everything by r squared. That gives us this equation right here. Now if we run the substitution p equals kr, we get exactly the function that um, the handbook states, which is this. This is called the Bessel equation, or Bessel's equation. And its solutions, there's a lot of them. The, but however, only one of them, only one kind of them, is well behaved at the origin, or at r equals zero. And those are denoted by j, and they are Bessel functions of the first kind. Now, Bessel functions, um, they all look kind of like dampered off sinusoids. Let's look at them right here. We have this and ignore a lot of the notation about that one real quick, but we'll come back to that. Now, let's note one thing. Here we have this p squared minus m squared. We already know that m equals zero. We defined that when we were looking at the phi equation. So we know that this is zero, and Bessel functions are defined with m, j specifically j sub m. So here we know that r of r is j sub zero of p, which you can look up in a lot of math textbooks as this function here. You can also write it as a sum in terms of its Taylor series, but for here, let's just write it in terms of this integral here. Now, are we done yet? Not quite. We have to plug in our boundary conditions. We know that r is equal to zero at the boundary, right? Because we're looking at the cylinder. It's a metal cylinder. Let's just look back again at what we're dealing with. We have this potential is equal to zero at the edge. So we know that r at r equals a is zero. Plugging this in, let's just look at the graph. This graph is of j sub zero. Where does it interact with zero? A lot. It has infinitely many intersections as you go out to infinity. It has this intersection, this intersection, this intersection. So let's just label them j sub 1, lowercase j. That's the first intersection point. And you can look these up in a lot of textbooks. I believe this value has a value of roughly 2.2 something, though I could be wrong. Don't quote me on that. So now we're left with r at r equals a is equal to j sub 0 at jn, where jn is the nth root of j sub 0. So this is always equal to 0. This means that k times a, sorry, k times a is equal to j sub n. But since j sub n depends on n, that means that k must also depend on n since a is constant. This means that k sub n is equal to j sub n over a. k sub n we referenced in z and in r. So we can go back to v and say that v is the sum of r of r times phi of phi times z of z. Which plugging these all in, we get this equation here. That it's an infinite sum because we have to account for all the possible values of n of j naught of j n r over a because this is equal to k times r times 1, which is phi, times this sine h function of z. So let's recap. We started off with Laplace's equation and cylindrical coordinates and an ansatz that v was a product of three functions. We then derived that v, the potential, is equal to the negative of a sum from n equals 1 to infinity of a sub n, a constant, times a function of k sub n. The issue is we still have this a sub n, which we don't know, so we're going to have to use our last boundary condition, the fact that the potential is equal to negative v1 at the height of z equals h over 2. Plugging this in and multiplying the left and right sides by negative 1, we get that the potential v1 is equal to this infinite sum from n equals 1 to infinity of a sub n times a function. The issue is we still have this a sub n. Now, I wasn't able to find this again on my own, so I had to do some more research and ended up finding some lecture notes from Richard Fitzpatrick at the University of Texas at Austin. I will link them in the description. In his notes, he uses a potential of that depends on phi and r at the top of the cylinder. However, for our situation, it's a lot more simple. Regardless, plugging in what we have into what he has, we get a sub n is this very large function. And therefore, we finally have our potential equation. Now that we have an equation for the potential inside of this airspace that's not water inside of our cylinder, we can start to ask what the electric field is inside here. We know that the electric field is just the negative gradient of the potential, which is written out here as negative r hat times dv dr. 
minus z hat times dvdz. Now there could also be a phi hat component here, but again, remember that this situation is symmetric and dvd phi is going to be zero because there's no phi aspect in v. So looking first at dvdr, we have the following equation. The derivative can move inside the sum here, so we get that it's ddr of j sub zero of knr. And looking at the definition for j, we know that j sub m is given by this equation here. And from this, it's relatively simple to derive that ddr of j sub 0 is equal to negative k sub n times j1, where j1, again, is defined with this j sub n function, just replace this m with a 1. So now we have this equation for dv dr, which we can plug into our final equation for e. Moving on to dv dz, we have that it's the negative sum. Again, the derivative moves inside of the sum to just to the part that has a z component in it, the root of sine h hyperbolic sine is cosh hyperbolic cosine. So then by the chain rule, we'll multiply this by this factor of k sub n, and we finally get that the electric field is r hat times this infinite sum plus z hat times this infinite sum. I hope that was helpful.